What's up, Marathon? I'm John Kissick, and today we're on a third part of a third part series talking about the Florida Keys Marine Sanctuary. And today we're going to talk to a coral ecologist, and he's going to explain to us all about the sea bottom corals, the importance of corals, and what we can do to help protect them. So let's welcome Kevin McCulley. Kevin McCulley, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, could you tell the people a little about your background and what you do with the coral restoration? Sure thing. Well, first off, thanks for having me. Glad to be having this conversation. Um, I'm a coral ecologist. Uh, currently, I'm employed at Nova Southeastern University as a research mm -hmm. assistant there. Uh, but I've been working on the coral reefs and the keys for a little over 10 years now. I started off with FWC when I first got down here, uh, working mostly on a monitoring program, just kind of mm -hmm. watching the reefs and seeing what was going on. And once I... Uh, Got involved in that and saw what was going on. I decided it was time to be a little more proactive and switched it up. And uh, currently, I'm working more hands-on, doing an intervention project with the disease outbreak that's going on. Okay. And what did you do in the past? Were you? Uh, how'd you get interested in in this? Um, tell you the truth, I kind of uh, fell into it, to be quite honest. Uh, I was uh, planning on going to medical school and decided uh, last minute that I didn't actually want to do that in the end. Uh, I decided I enjoyed scuba diving and uh, had just started hearing about how the reefs were really starting to suffer some, from some problems and thought uh, what a great thing to get involved with and uh, get ahead of the game maybe and be proactive and maybe try and make an actual difference in something and not just uh, watch something or study something, but make an actual difference. Okay. Um, so the main... Uh reason you came in, you're part of a three-part series of the sanctuary, Florida Keys Marine Sanctuary issue, and um, so we've already had uh, Sarah Fangman on the show talking about what we need to protect. We've had uh, Gary Nichols on about, and he, you know, is very forward about saying we need to protect this, but we also need to have access to certain areas to keep, uh, you know, life. <laughs> Sure, there's, no reason to protect here. there's no reason to protect it if we can't enjoy it. enjoy it. Well, there's more than that, I have to say. Um, and, then, um, and then you're here to tell us exactly what's going on with the reefs. So the reefs are they're dead or dying, so will keeping people off the reefs help at all? I know you mentioned to me in the past that if they're healthy, we can have twice as much volume of people There's actually standing on them and people touching the Corals. That's never the ideal. You never want that to <laughs> no. happen. Um, but they certainly could manage that, that kind of problem a lot easier if they weren't already in the state they were in. Um, certainly the reefs are in decline. They are by no means dead, though. Uh, that's an over-exaggeration. Okay. They, are, they are on the brink, uh, to be sure. They are definitely devastated at the moment, but they are not gone. And a single coral, given the right conditions, can produce thousands or sometimes millions of new corals throughout its lives. So you don't need a huge seed population to save the reef. Uh, but you can't lose it all, for sure. If there's nothing left to seed the reef, then you've, then you've lost the battle. Um, we are getting pretty close to that point, though, unfortunately. In fact, it is so bad that uh, our latest project has involved uh, a little thing we call coral napping, uh, going out ahead of where this disease line is, out uh, so far down in the Marquesas. It's made it all the way through there. So mm -hmm. going out ahead of that disease line geographically and collecting some healthy corals, getting them into labs and aquariums. Uh, this is really our last ditch effort, is getting them out of the ocean, putting them in a, a stable environment somewhere in a land-based operation. Uh, FLAC, Florida Aquarium, is a huge partner in that. Uh, so getting them off the reef and actually keeping them in a safe environment is one of the ways that we have in our disposal right now to try and preserve the few we have left uh, for a seed population in the future. And let's talk a little more about that, though, because corals are a very complex organism. So this, they grow on top of each other, and that's why you see them build up. Sure thing, yeah. Uh, they are actually animals, which is a big misconception. A lot of people don't look at a coral and, and see an animal. Just a rock uh, a lot of people look at it and see a rock. Sure, very pretty rocks, to be sure, but a lot of people just interpret them that way. Well, they are actually animals, uh, and they're a symbiotic animal, so they actually have a little plant, uh, an algae, really, that lives inside with them. Mm -hmm. uh, so those two have a very complicated relationship just between themselves. Uh, the corals between the individual corals do as well have a complicated relationship. Like you said, they grow on top of each other around stuff. And uh, the disease outbreak right now is affecting what we call the stony coral tissues of the reef. Okay. They're actually the reef builders. They're the ones that make those rocks that form those hard skeletons yeah. and that actually build the reef. So once we lose those species, the reef starts to degrade pretty quickly. They're the, the actual height of the reef itself starts to degrade. We've already lost a number of inches even that mm -hmm. has been documented. And, those kinds of losses uh, certainly complicate the story for things like storm surge and the magnitude of uh, storm surges that we'll experience here on land. 
So losing the stony corals is really an alarming situation because they do form, as you said, the basis of the reef, the foundation of the reef. That's what everything else grows on. And uh, even though corals only make up about 1% of the ocean surface in their ocean bottom, they support at least 50% of the life out there. I mean, we're talking the fish and the dolphins, the turtles, everything lives or uses a reef at some point in, the light, in its life. So it's not just us and losing the beauty for us. It's, it's a huge diversity issue if we lose these corals. Right. Um, so... Um so 80, 90%, 80 to 90% of the world's uh, mass bleaching is due to this figure to the rising water temperatures. That's certainly the main stress for the bleaching side. And the mm -hmm. bleaching is just one of, unfortunately, about 30 or 40 problems we can point out right now. And that, that is the biggest issue, is that there isn't just one big issue. There's not one thing we can point our finger at and say, let's fix that and problem solved. But these issues play on each other. They build on each other. So it's really difficult to assess and, and plan for the effects of just one of these issues when they are all working together in conjunction. So the heat stress is the main bleaching issue, but bleaching isn't a fatality event. Bleaching doesn't have to kill the corals just because that coral turns still white. Alive, right? It's still alive, yeah, it's got time to recover. Uh, the bleaching is because that little plant we mentioned earlier, that algae, it got kicked out of the coral because the coral was stressed, yeah. didn't know what to do, so kicked those guys out to try and fix itself. It can pick up new ones. It can pick up different ones, and sometimes that's even beneficial for the coral when they pick up new zooxanthellae, that's the algae. Uh, some of them are better than they were before. Some of them are more heat tolerant. So bleach stress isn't the worst thing in the world for them. It's when we have these constantly high water temperatures. We're not talking mm -hmm. about an hour. We're talking about a week or so of 90-degree-plus water, and if it comes back down after about a week or so, those corals will it's be fine. fine. But oh, good. Okay, so um, so we're talking also about the water quality. Is it too late? I mean, you know, we mentioned, you know, we talked about the, um, you know, the sugar farmers and the uh, cattle farmers and all that runoff has caused those algae blooms and, that we've seen and then they disappeared, but um, that has the changed chemistry of the water and that has effect on our coral system. That's absolutely correct. <clears throat> uh, water quality is one of the major issues we face here and it is also unfortunately one of the major things that we as a community in the Keys can't address alone. Uh, that's not something that we can fix just here in our community. As you just mentioned, a lot of these problems stem from maybe central Florida or certainly all over south Florida. The cattle is a big problem, the sugar is a big problem, and all those effluents eventually make it down here to the Keys. So that's obviously not something we can just put up a dam and stop or something like that. We're going right. to have to work in conjunction with these other communities around Florida in order to fix that problem. Um, they're making great strides on that. They're starting to trying look into to that find. area. We're, str we're trying to get that going. Uh, it's a long-term problem, though. Uh, that doesn't mean that there's nothing else we can do, though. Water right. quality is certainly one of these many factors that are playing a problem here, but it's not the only thing we can do. It, while we're working on that, there's also 15 or 20 other things we can do. You said even if we, we start put clean water in now, it, you know, it's going to take a long time, right? It's going to take a while. The ocean's a big place, <laughs> for sure. And uh, by the time we've gotten the levels of the pollutants up to the levels they are, that took a while to do. So it's going to take a while to get them to go the other way as well. Like, so it's, it's not a quick it's like fix. A 20, 30 years? I'd say that's probably a minimal kind of time frame, minimal, 20 okay. to 30 years. Uh, these ecological that's if we start now. That's if we start now, so, correct, yeah. So, so these ecological that's one, processes that's major issue. take a while. So in the meantime, we could be protecting the reefs and um, in many other ways absolutely right. some of these some of these no anchoring things just yesterday i was speaking with some folks from coral restoration foundation who do a bunch of the outplanting around here and put the new corals out well one of their main outplanting sites a pickle reef just experienced an anchor drop and drag just last week uh, and it destroyed 50 or so of their new outplants that are about two years old they're beautiful corals and back uh, to square one yeah. from one anchor uh, no. so education is really a big um big part of saving. Uh, I think so. If you ask me, education is a silver bullet to quite a few problems in this country, but certainly environmental issues. If, if you don't know what's going on out there, you can't care about it. Right. So, yep, and that's the other thing. It's the ocean, for most people, it's out of sight, so it's out of mind. You don't see, you just see the beautiful ocean and sunsets and so on, but you don't see what's going on underneath the ocean. You know, you know, the divers, snorkelers, they see it, but... Sure, sure, so and even folks who do think that they are seeing more of it oftentimes aren't. I mean, even avid divers are only getting two or three dives a year at certain sites, so unless you're out there actually on the front lines and have them watching this thing day by day, year by year, it's tough to actually see and comprehend the scale of what's going on. There's, there's still fish in the supermarket, so it's tough to argue that uh, the reefs are degrading the way they are, and also folks who just don't have a good baseline level of knowledge, all the tourists that are coming down, it's awesome to see them enjoying the reef, but oftentimes they aren't exactly sure what they're looking at. You know, the reef 
just because these corals are dying doesn't mean it's empty. There's still pretty sea fans and there's still some pretty algaes that oftentimes will look like corals. There's a lot of stuff on the reef still currently, even though it is in this sad state of affairs. So you come down from somewhere else, don't know what a coral reef is, and it might still look beautiful to you. You just don't have a good baseline to know what it should be looking like. Right. And that's what we talked about in the past is um, um, when I was a kid growing up, I had the advantage of uh, going to St. Thomas and Grand Caymans and in uh, even Jamaica, that's where I first learned to dive when I was 12 years old, and I couldn't believe how beautiful it was. And then when I got to about 21, 22, I went to Cancun, and that was the first time I saw a dead reef, and I could not believe it. It was very devastating to me because I, I couldn't believe that something that could happen. <laughs> and in that short of time. And that's because they've done, and they even told you then, um, it's because of all the construction that was going on there, and it was, you know, they had a big boom of hotels, and then all that runoff dust and so on killed the reef. and. Um, but they did, um, they were doing education at that time. Back mm. then, <laughs> we're talking probably, uh, you know, 89, 90, they were doing education, mm -hmm. don't touch anything, because sure. we're trying to save the reef, you know. Back then, that was about all we knew to tell people to do, even yep. really. So coral science, marine science in general is kind of a new science as far as sciences go. People have been doing math for ages. We've only been really been looking at the reefs since the 70s or 80s, so... That was certainly one of the first things that we knew is, so, well, we, you can see a direct correlation. You touch it, you drop an anchor on it, it's dead. So we knew that, don't do that. We've come a long way in the last 20 or 30 years in, for, in terms of our science and our techniques and our restoration abilities and our, just our general understanding of the reef. But even still, we're playing catch up in a big way because this problem, as you just mentioned, is happening so quickly on a scale of, I think you just mentioned somewhere about 20 years, that kind of destruction was possible. It takes hundreds of years for these reefs to grow that kind of way. So to see them be destroyed this quickly is really alarming. And uh, to not do anything doesn't seem like an option anymore. I've heard we lost like 50% of our corals in the last 30 years alone. That's absolutely correct. It, and probably higher than 50%. Yeah. That's probably a slightly conservative ev es estimate. And even over the last five years since this disease outbreak has occurred, we've lost another 80% on top of that. 80% of what was left of that has now disappeared. So sites in the Northern Keys in particular where this outbreak started are quite barren. Uh, again, they're not gone. They're not entirely dead, but they are very close and they are on the brink. So stepping in and taking some action is imperative at this point. Okay. And so... With sanctuary um, enforcements, have you seen the areas that they have uh, protected to see improvements, or is it really uh, something that works? Uh, well, I'd say our biggest success story in that area is the dry tortugas. Okay. Um, certainly, it's a little more inaccessible than the reefs right here on the mainland, or right here in the Keys. Uh, so that helps alone, just being more isolated. But that, again, speaks to the point of less activity on a reef being good for a reef. So. Currently, the Dry Tortugas is the last bastion in the Keys. It is the only place so far or left that does not experience any disease right now. Mm -hmm. It is still a clean reef, and it is still has the historically about the 30% coral cover that the Keys used to have. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a little bit of a jump for the diseased line to get out there, but the disease has already jumped to the Virgin Islands, Jamaica, right. other places. So mm -hmm. it's only a matter of time before it gets there, unfortunately. But they're a huge success story in terms of curtailing the amount of people using that resource and being able to bolster that resource because of it. And that's from the hands-on or, or the hands-on the boat traffic you know any oil dumping out of bilges right. all that stuff sunscreen on the tourists certainly the the actual physical interaction with folks has gotten much better over the last 20 years as you said a second ago we've been educating folks on that side of things for quite a while other things like the sunscreens and the chemical interactions we're just coming around to ourselves uh, so the physical interaction is certainly a problem, but all the ancillary things that just come with using a reef, you got to get out there, you got to burn gas, you got to burn diesel, you got to put on the sunscreen. So all, right. all those factors play a role. Okay. Um, so, uh, so we talked about the education. So that Blue Star program they're talking about, is that, so that would be beneficial to, for loud towners and the kettle boats and the divers and so on. It would be better than nothing. It's not for a bad sure. thing. It's not a bad thing. Not it's bad certainly thing better than people. doing nothing for them. Um, yeah. I've, I work pretty exclusively with Blue Star operators down here when I, when I have to go out and do my research. If I'm not just renting my own boat and running out mm -hmm. there, I, I try and preferentially use the Blue Star operators. And they're awesome people, and they definitely care about the reef, as everybody does. Um, but the Blue Star stuff, I would say, is more in the neighborhood of the minimum that we should be doing for that. It's, yeah. it's a nice little speech, but there's very little enforcement going on with that, and it's, it's a voluntary program as it stands right now. So it, it's nice. It's better than doing nothing, but there's certainly a few more steps we could take on um, top of that. Let's explain that. What do you think more we could do? Well, uh, just beefing up the program itself. It's a great idea, but as the, as the implication... 
implementation of it currently it just seems to be on the minimal side of things. It could be a, a more beefy class. It could be more than just a two minute speech to the divers before they're going out. It could be more than just a couple hour class for the operators that are doing it. So maybe just beefing that program up a little bit would be good for everybody. Maybe something back at the dive shop or something, a little presentation they have to watch or... Sure, on, on both ends. On the sanctuary educating the operators and the operators educating their patrons. I think both, both sides could do a little bit better job of getting a little bit more information to everybody involved. Okay, well, what, what more information do they need that they're not getting? Um, well, I, I, maybe just the importance of it, really. That, that doesn't seem to be stressed. It's certainly, they're telling folks, this is our reef and we gotta love it and everything, but maybe, maybe just the seriousness of the conversations could be beefed up just a little bit. I do think that the general knowledge is out there just right now, but the, the implications and the why we're doing this might make it be sink in a little, a little more. Like, that, that'd be a this, good start. This is a good concern and it's an issue. And we this need to this is why it. we're doing it. And if this, you don't help us, I you mean, won't be able to come back. It'll be gone next year. This is what it used like to This is what it used to look like. And that's what it looks that like now. Help. That could help. So yeah, a little visual representations are good. Please don't touch anything. Don't mess it up. Don't come here with your boat and ruin it. Um, so okay. Sure, but uh, also, you know, with this discussion we're having now with the blueprint. Um, it is a good first step, that Blue Star. Opening it up to everybody might not be a bad idea. Instead of just having that be commercial operators, maybe if you want to come down here and rent a boat, maybe you need to sit right. through a couple hour course. So just expanding on that right. and getting that information out to, to more people as possible is, is a good idea. I talked a little bit about that with Sarah Fangman and mm -hmm. um, you know they have an app they're coming out with, they're trying to implement that will help tell you where to go, where not to go. Sure. What else, you know, to make it more interesting than that is to, you know, you, you might see these kind of fish, this type of coral, you know, make it interesting. And But the education needs to be that when you come here, you have to try to download the app before you get here and like have signs at boat ramps or billboards. Sure. Well, our TDC has a pretty good uh, handle on that kind of stuff. Yeah. They're pretty good at getting the word out from what I've noticed over the last decade or so. They, mm -hmm. they can reach a pretty wide, wide audience when they try to. So I think we have the ability to get that program out there and get that knowledge out there. It's just a matter of uh, following through and actually getting it done. Okay. Now, are you familiar with the area um, by the state park that goes out a mile by Tennessee Reef? There's like a mile long stretch there. No. Yes, sir. Um, and Gary brought up a point is that nobody really looked at that to see what they're protecting and um, I would what? push back on that just a okay. touch uh, personally even I've, I've looked in there uh, we actually have sites all up and down the Keys and a couple of them are very close to if not in that region um, the argument that is a little harder to refute though is what's left there to protect right uh, to be quite honest the upper Keys have suffered dramatically over the last three to four years and while it is the proper habitat for coral grow in, there's very little bit of it there now. Uh, it is unlikely you would drop an anchor on a coral in that corridor at this point in time. <laughs> it's not there. That's not <laughs> how it historically was. That's not how it should look, but it is right. pretty unlikely you will drop a coral on there right now. That's not to say though that we shouldn't protect it. Uh, this is a long-term process. We gotta start talking about 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 years in the future when we're talking about rebuilding our reefs. And saving this corridor might not have a huge effect even in our lifetimes, but the implications further on down the road are tough to predict, but almost for sure are a positive implication if we can reduce the use in those areas. It might not be beneficial and it, we won't fix the problem tomorrow with this, no. but it's a good first step in helping us save some areas that we know are historically ecologically important and should be again. Okay, there's more of a hands-off because there's different proposals that, of course, Sanctuary has the different plans. Um, some are just a uh, no wake zones, some are no no go through zones no, um, and I guess the fishermen's biggest deal is that you know that's major corridor for them running up and down the the reef line to pick up the traps and so on so that is kind of sure and as an avid boater myself I run through there <laughs> frequently run, myself you want to go several miles out and then several miles back <laughs> just to avoid it but yeah, um, I can absolutely see the arguments there. Uh, like I said, I'm an avid boater myself. Uh, I, I like to run through that area. It's very pretty, uh, and it is in, on the way to and from many other places. So perhaps that that proposal could be looked at a little bit more in depth. Um, I, none of these are finalized. That's something we got to keep in mind as well. These are all proposals. This is a draft proposal. Right. Mm -hmm. It's possible to make amendments to this stuff, and perhaps uh, this is one that would could benefit from a little more scrutiny. Maybe we don't need it to be no motor all the way out to 200 feet deep. Maybe that's <laughs> not necessary. So we just got to keep in mind these are drafts, and they're definitely up for a little bit of tweaking through this process. Okay, so let's um, um, talk about if we do nothing at all, which is proposal one or A, <laughs> do nothing, what's going to happen? 
We're tough to fully predict, but most likely there won't be any fish left in the Keys in about 15, 20 years. Uh, we're at that state. It is really that dire. No action is really not an option if we want our kids and the rest of the world to be able to enjoy this reef going forward. Um, it's tough to it's tough to prove a negative, I guess. You can't really say that if we don't do a thing, this is exactly what's going to happen. But we've seen over the last 30 years uh, the declines. Uh, the first project I worked for when I got here, like I said, was a monitoring project. They have monitored the same corals on the same stretch of reef uh, for about 30 years. And there's never been a year of growth in the Keys in that time. There's never been a year of improvement. It's always been a decline on some level. Some years far worse than others. During the cold snaps of 2014, 2015, there were like 20% losses. So. Yeah. Almost every year, or every year rather, for about 30 years since we've been monitoring, it's been declined. So doing nothing we know is not an option. Keeping the status quo is only going to keep us on the same track. So if we want these corals in this reef and the fish, the turtles, the dolphins, the whole nine yards to be around, something has to be done. That something is up for debate. There's definitely various degrees of what, what we can or maybe should do, uh, and the science is still out of it on some of those things. but. Personally, I'm, I'm for going a little bit further than maybe what we might think is right. necessary now because I'd rather protect it a little bit longer, a little bit better for now rather than lose it in 20 years because we didn't do quite enough. Sure. So that's the, uh, the debate is, um, sure, you can, you can the fish and even Gary Nichols, he meant to, we need to sustain our life. <laughs> we need to sustain fishing. So doing nothing is not an option either. You have to... If you want to you go fishing in 20 years from now, you better do something now well, because I'm, there will be no fishermen, no I'm tourists. I'm to hear him say that, to be honest, yes, because that's exactly right. Uh, I mean, it's uh, very sensible. Extractive resources yeah. just can't stay status quo anymore. The, re the environment just isn't producing what it used to produce. The, the schools, the congregations, the, the, the spawning aggregations just aren't as big as they used to be. That's a fact. We, they're documented facts. We have the evidence. We have the science behind that. So fishing at the same levels in the same way as we traditionally have just isn't sustainable anymore. So I'm not saying nobody needs to go fishing. Of course, we all love fish. I love fishing. Everybody wants to be doing that. And the commercial folks obviously make a living on that. So we can't just get rid of it. But we have to be able to tweak it in a way that works best for everybody. We want these guys and gals to still be able to have their livelihoods. Of course, we all love living in the Keys. This is how they make their life and their living. We want that to continue. Are we all going to have to make some adjustments? I think we are in order to keep it going for the future generations. That's correct. Uh, to build upon that, um, I have a lot, several people tell me, tourists uh, that have been coming for years, and they said, man, I remember going out fishing for two hours, and we could fill our cooler up with fish and catch our limit, and we're out. And then um, now when we go, we spend all day and barely get you know, our limit. So uh, I'd say that's a pretty common story. I'd yep. say, yes, yeah, just about any local has been here more than just a few years. Uh, that's a pretty common story. We can see it with our own eyes. I think that is, in this discussion about this blueprint, I think that's something we can all agree on, is that things have changed. Um, I don't think anybody is arguing, no matter which side of this debate you're on, I don't think anybody's arguing that things are just fine. Uh, I think we all agree that something needs to be done. It's just how do we get together and agree on exactly the best way for the environment, for the locals, for the commercial fishermen, for everybody to get on the same page. That's the only way we're going to get this done. We can't just go out and enforce or pass a bunch of laws that nobody's going to listen to or right. people are going to break out of spite or just because they think they can do bait. So we've all got to be on the same page to make these changes, for right. sure. So we definitely need to, we need the restrictions. We need to have enforcement of the restrictions. And then we have to have the education to keep uh, to, uh, the people, on the, you know, most people here, That's <laughs> they're quite aware of what the situation is and what to do. Well, not so much what to do, I'd argue. A lot of them, I'd okay. say almost everybody is aware of the situation, but these kinds of problems, the scale of these is just so big. It's hard for a person to sit down and reason out, what can I do to help? Especially when you extrapolate it out to a global scale, you start thinking about global warming and sea level rise. Well, it's really easy to say, I can't affect that. I'm, I'm me. It's me and my family. I can't do anything about that. So right. a lot of folks are aware of these issues, but don't really know where to turn. So that education, I think, is a silver bullet here. If we can get people the, the knowledge to feel empowered to do something, I think we could change some minds and get people proactively engaged in this. This is their backyard, too. They don't want to save it. Everybody does. We just don't know how yet, or most folks don't know how or what to do. So changing that aspect, I think, could go a long way as well. You, hit t you touched on enforcement as well, though, and that is a tough argument to refute. It, it's quite obvious that the enforcement we have currently isn't quite sufficient. It's a okay. huge area of reef out here. We've got 200 linear miles of reef right here to protect. 
and we don't have the law enforcement to handle what we've got already. Yeah. So before we get the funding, or before we change the laws and all that, we need to adjust the funding and, and the amount of manpower that we have from our law enforcement agencies down here. I spend weeks on the water and oftentimes don't see one law enforcement drive by me. Yeah. That's a problem. You can't have all these rules with right. no enforcement. That's not going to get us anything done. Yeah. Um, that's the other thing is um, a lot of I've seen a lot of uh, backlash in the lower keys and their their biggest beef is why don't you manage properly manage what you've already sanctuaried and before you add more restrictions because you're not even managing that properly so sure that's well a, to that I, I have a few things to say to that first <laughs> right? off who knows what it would look like without the sanctuary right. there you can't prove that either had we done nothing 20 25 years ago perhaps those ecosystems would be completely barren at this point so there's no way to prove that the sanctuary isn't helpful Helpful. There's also plenty of things, as we mentioned earlier, that are out of the sanctuary's hands alone. There's nothing right. the sanctuary by itself can do about our regional water quality issues. Yeah. So there are some things they just can't address. That's not what the sanctuary was designed to do. They were designed for a specific purpose to protect the fisheries and the reefs. That's their wheelhouse. That's what they can do. Right. So we got to remember that when we're talking about what the sanctuary is trying sure. to sanctuary. Um, but uh, those backcountry things, those are also, in the lower keys things, a lot of those are our front lines of defense for water quality things. We're just realizing how important those seagrass communities are back there. These are things that we just can't go on losing if we want a chance of fixing this problem. Sure, let's talk about that seagrass. Um, explain how important the seagrass beds are and how, why we need to keep people out of them. <laughs> there are filters. Um, it's a lot like a lawn or a pasture out there on land would be it's it soaks up a lot of nutrients uh, that's what they do best in fact and not only that not only are they absorbing nutrients and toxins that would eventually make you to the reef proper they're also a nursery these these seagrass beds are out there protecting all the juveniles of the fish that we like to catch from their adults the turtles spend a lot of time in these things so they're incredibly important ecosystems and they are suffering in a great way almost exclusively from physical interactions. I mean, there's definitely an overload of nutrients and, and water quality issues going on, but that is a really easy one to look at and say, man, that's a huge prop scar. I know where that mm -hmm. came from. That's right. not a mystery. <laughs> and you yep. can take those satellite views or go on Google Maps and you can see them all over the Keys. Oh, yeah. That's a big problem to fix and it seems like an easy one to get a handle on. We know what the problem is. We know what the solution is. That doesn't happen often in the world of science, from what I've from what I've experienced. No. So when when you got an easy correlation like that, that's an easy one to say. Well, let's do something about that. Okay, um, yeah, I've had, had people tell me, oh boy, it's so shallow out here. I had to make my own channel. I was like, oh, wow. you, you can't do that. <laughs> can't do that. You try to educate yourself. So go buy a chart. Go educate yourself a little bit. Don't drive to the seagrass, please. Sure, and that so, comes back to those Blue Star operators. Right. Maybe if we could expand that program to being for anybody who wants to come down and rent a boat, not just for our mm -hmm. commercial operators here who do know the reefs well and do know not to run right. over seagrass. If we could get that information out to anybody who shows up here wanting to enjoy the reefs, that would probably go a long way. Yeah, as I mentioned, like Sarah, maybe you have some commercials in Miami and so on that so when you come down here with your boat, you already you know there's something going on. Yeah. Um, How many billboards do we have up and down the Keys? We can get some word out there. <laughs> you can get a couple up there. Something's better than nothing on that point. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Every little bit helps for sure. That's that's the point in the struggle we're at. Every little bit helps. So let's uh, sum it all up. Um, so the, there is a need for the sanctuary. There's 100%. a need for education. Education. Um, we have to protect our corals, but we also have to enjoy them <laughs> yeah and work together work together to, to all uh, users um, we all love this environment fishermen the commercial fishermen the um, uh, tourists and so on they all have to you know get along <laughs> yeah we all so. live down here because we love this place and those of us in the science community live and work here because we love this place we're not trying to say nobody needs to go there we love enjoying these reefs uh, we're all going to have to make some sacrifices on some level, though, in order to keep enjoying them. If we want these reefs to be around, and this, by the way, is the world's third largest reef. That's, yeah, that's huge. Jeez. This is a huge reef. This is unbelievably important, not just for us and our economy, but the ecosystem of the entire ocean. I mean, if you lose the world's thar third largest reef, there are major repercussions that we can't even imagine for the long term. So we've all got to work together to do something about this. It's status quo is not an option anymore. I'm talking about the, um, so what were we talking about? We were talking about the uh, tourists and stuff coming down and uh, getting education out, um, so everybody can enjoy the reefs. And so, what what was, what would be your ultimate solution? <laughs> oh man, that's a big question. There you go. Um, if you're in charge, what? what well, do you do? Uh, 
back to something I said earlier, I don't think there is an ultimate solution. There isn't just a one policy or a set of policies we can put out there and say, this is how we do it. These things work off each other. These problems play off each other in ways we don't even understand yet. Uh, marine science is so new, we don't have a good handle on exactly how ocean acidification affects the heat stress of the corals, it affects the disease outbreaks. We haven't tied all those pieces together yet. So I don't think there is one big grand solution. It's going to be a lot of little solutions. It's going to be a lot of us as a community coming together and working with the sanctuary to find out what's best in each region, what's best for each reef on that side, even on that smaller scale. We need to figure out every reef's different. So we need to figure out what's going to work best for each part and each, each environment we have here. So my main solution would be just what the sanctuary is doing, outreach, uh, getting the inputs to everybody, putting out these plans, seeing what people think about them, seeing what works best. We've got the science side of things. The sanctuary has a science side of things, but that's not the end of the story. There's a lot of, place, a lot of pieces of this puzzle, so we need to combine that science with the public sentiments and public knowledge. There's people certainly around the Keys, commercial fishermen in particular, that know these waters exceptionally well to a degree right. that even sometimes the sanctuary doesn't know the waters that well. So getting everybody together, I think, is my biggest solution for this. Getting everybody to work together and we all know we need to save it. So getting everybody on the same page, I think, is our good goal here. Right, and that's what I talked about with uh, Gary, that he invited uh, the sanctuary people to come out on the boat. Sure. Come come see what you're actually trying to save. Let's, let's find a solution and let's work together. Um, we're not telling you to take a hike. <laughs> So let's 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 do what's best for everybody in the long run. So yeah, well, it, and that's amazing that he's yeah. willing to do that and, and work with folks that way. But and Sarah's been very uh, uh, unlike, I guess, some of the other directors in the past. That she's very perceptive and very open to comments and, and or to ideas. And she sure has been. She's been a great change for the sanctuary. Uh, the, the sanctuary was kind of stagnating there for a few years, and she's been a, a wonderful breath of fresh air. She's extremely dedicated, and she, as you said, is open. She's not just coming down here and, and laying down the law and saying this is what's happening. She's she's willing to work with folks. She wants to work with folks to understand how to do this best. That's. We all do. We wanted what we all want what's best for the reef and for the people who live here. We all are in this together. Nice. But uh, to Gary's point a little bit though, while some of the folks like Sarah Feynman and the folks maybe at the top end of the management structure of the Nova aren't out on boats every day and don't see it, folks like myself are. I right. spend six, <laughs> seven days a week out there. I have I have extensive knowledge firsthand of what's going on out there. Which the sanctuary does too. They've got hundreds of employees that do that as well. So while while Sarah Fangman herself might not be on a boat and might not have put her eyes on that coral yesterday, many people have. Uh, this isn't just anecdotal. We have the science. We have done the work. We know what's going on out there, and it's a, it's a scary picture at the moment. All right, Kevin. So give us the final word. What? Final final thoughts. Oh, geez. Final well, thought. <laughs> I love the keys. I hope to be able to live here for the rest of my life. Uh, the only way that's going to happen, though, is if we all get together and work on this problem and do something big and immediate, or else we're all going to lose our homes here and our livelihoods and, and this place we love. And it won't come back in our lifetimes if we let it get that far. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. That was a nice insight on what's actually happening with the reefs, <laughs> as opposed to uh, we want to lay down the law and why we need to... <laughs> go on the water and so that was that so hopefully people learn something well thank you very much for starting these conversations this is a fantastic service you're doing here so thanks for having well, thank me. you <laughs> so folks hopefully we've learned something over the last three series of videos and uh, that we've taken something away from this and hopefully I've changed some of your minds about the need to protect the ocean um, we have support from the fishing industry the people out in the field and the sanctuary people themselves. So hopefully um, we can all come together and we can uh, do something to make a difference for all of us. If you've enjoyed this type of content, please subscribe to the channel, hit the like button, and leave a comment below. That's the only way we'll know if we're doing a good job or not. Whether you like the show or whether you hated the show, please leave a comment. And if you have an idea for uh, an upcoming episode, we'd love to hear from you. So we'll see you next time.